means God visible and invisible. Now we have inherited many ideas about God from the saints and sages and seers of the past. Generally speaking, I think particularly in the Western world, the idea prevails that God is formless. Christianity believes that God has not any form, so does Mohammedanism and of course Judaism. Zoroastrianism, which is between the East and the West, you might say, if you consider the regions in which Semitic religions flourish to be somewhat western, Zoroastrianism also has considered God as found. Buddhism does not speak about any God, nor Jainism. Hinduism, however, believes God to be formless, but also as having form. Now, when we examine closely all these affirmations about the nature of God, particularly whether he has any form or he is without form, we begin to see certain modifications of the ultimate and absolute position. Yes, in Christianity they maintain that God is formless, but they seem to have modified this idea first by thinking of God as the Son. You know, if you believe in the Trinitarian doctrine of Christianity, you have to accord the same importance to God the Father as to God the Son and God as Holy Spirit. We know that God the Son is no different from God the Father, and therefore who has been considered to be the incarnation of God, has a form. Not only did he have a form while he was on earth. According to the Orthodox Christian belief, he resurrected with the same body, what to speak of the same form. His very body was resurrected, proving that his body was not vulnerable to death. There is then a form of God. You might say that that is not exactly what we mean by God having a form. But you see, when you study all these things from the standpoint of experience, then all these little logical distinctions between Father and Son do not have any validity. When you realize God the Son, that is to the Christ, who is God with form, you are considered to have actually realized to God because Christ was fully divine. He was not only partly divine, he was in the fullness of divinity. And he was fullness of divinity is realized as having thought. Now then you also remember how they oftentimes spoke about the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost descending upon people and it was considered to have taken the form of light, but that light is in the form of a dove. Yes, Holy Spirit here also seems to be all light, but that light has a form. And I would draw your further attention to this kind of realization. You all know that in almost every religion has God is spoken of. Or any ultimate reality. Even in Buddhism, where they do not speak about God, but they speak about a state. If you permit me to use that term, which is not quite logical, Nirvana. Even all has been identified with light. Oftentimes you read and speak and hear of light divine. Divine essence. God is light. The question is, is it then visible to our eyes, is that light, divine light, perceivable to our senses or to our mind? Should we then call that it has a certain form? 
can we see earthly life? We know that it has form. It may not have any definite form as that of a man or a plant or a flower or things like that. Nevertheless, life has form. When we hear of Moses having this vision, he saw burning bush, bush burning, it is said. A bush has been burst into flame, he recognized that was divine light shining with the skin of a bush, but there was light there. You come across some Mahatma pictures, I have come across, where God himself is indicated as light, shining light. Of course, you know, Mahavans are very iconoclastic, and they do not like the idea of God being represented by any kind of form or anything at all. They, they are very uh, reluctant even to represent God symbolically, though that symbology has not uh, altogether been avoided by Mahavadanism. Even they speak of God as light. Now, what form of light is that? Is it just infinite light with no form? If it is not, then how is it perceived? Is light seen as light? It's just as you see a fire burning at a distance, or somebody switching on light in the darkness, and then you are aware that there is light. Is there that kind of light? Well, I think when we examine all these experiences, and I have not mentioned the vision of uh, the Madonna, which many of the Catholic saints and sages have claimed, because according to the Catholic theology, Mary is not considered to be God, although the tendency in Catholicism has been to present the Mother of God as more and more divine. And not long ago, one Catholic priest of a high position of Canada, he openly declared that it is just a question of time before Mary is declared to be also divine, just as our son is. Now, here, as I say, logically you may not say that these are visions of God. But from the standpoint of experience, and I would say, psychologically speaking, that these visions are so close to the vision of God, that that which is lacking in the name of vision of God becomes fulfilled in this other vision. So then a Christian, a devout Christian also, enjoys the form of God, enjoys God as endowed with form in one way or another. In Hinduism we have been very open about it. I know many of you will say, as if you shall admit that probably this Hindu vision of God as a real form is not all the illusion. Nevertheless, if you ascribe form to anything, you also ascribe finitude, limitation. And certainly you could not say that God is finite or limited, and therefore you could not say it is the true or ultimate vision of God. But that is not the way we have looked at it. I shall have occasion in course of this talk to dwell upon this point first. At the present, I would like to dwell on another point. Now, my subject is God visible and invisible. In other words, I believe that God is visible as well as He is invisible. If you ask what the meaning of these terms, meanings of these terms are, and that is what I want to dwell upon, in order that I can make my standpoint very clear to you, what do I exactly mean by visible or by invisible? Now, of course, invisible carries at once this implication and it cannot be seen with the eyes. Now the question here is that when devotees claim who have seen the vision of the Christ or a Hindu devotee claims to have seen the vision of Vishnu or Shiva or Kali or some other aspects of, the, of divinity, what is their claim? Do they say that they actually see this from the visionary eyes? That is to say this, these eyes, this, this uh, carnal eyes. That is to say, which are part of the body. And therefore, uh, you would say that if we perceive anything with these eyes, then whatever we perceive falls into the category of the same sense objects which we see with these eyes. And then, is God only one of the sense objects? Or here is a point to ponder over. We find, for example, in some of the visions of Sri Ramakrishna, 
Here I would draw your attention, pointed attention. In some of the visions, he not only saw the divine vision, but he also saw them against the normal background in which he lived. He saw the trees, he saw the pathways in the garden, he saw the river Ganga, he saw every other thing, and in the midst of all these things he also saw a divine person. God himself is a certain form. Well, now you will ask this question, with what eyes did he see this form? I have not the least doubt, although we do not have any kind of actual testimony on this point, historical testimony. But if another person were present there, when Sri Ramakrishna had a vision of this kind, he would not have seen the divine figure. He would have seen the trees, he would have seen the river, he would have seen every other thing as we all see, we seem to be all agreeing on the point that we see, see the same objective work around ourselves. But this divine vision, this person is not a king. Now as I said, if we don't have it, then we should ask it, how do you know it? Maybe if a person were there, he would also have seen what Sri Ramakrishna saw. Well, I won't argue that point, but I can just say that if it is a divine vision, if it is a vision of the divine, then of course you have to have the qualifications of having such a vision. Not only the instruments or the means of having such a vision, but also the qualifications. Suppose you give me binoculars to see me. Now suppose my eyes are very dim. In spite of all these things, I will not have the distinct vision. I lack the qualification. Whereas another person with normal vision, with the help of his glasses, he will be able to see distant things very clearly. We may have the means, and I think everybody has this means, but everybody has not got the qualification. I know you could probably distinguish my expression. You might say, well, if they have the means, then they should be able to have the same uh, uh, the ability to use these means and also have the same result for using these means. Well, you know what I mean. Whatever expressions he use, you have to have the ability. Uh, that is what I mean by the qualifications to employ these means for the purpose of vision. Sri Ramakrishna has gone through a great deal of spiritual struggle, even spiritual struggle, and when he began to have visions of God, besides he was born with a kind of mind which is unequal in the history of religion. That he was the most extraordinary person. I am not here judging him as a great teacher, accepted on the incarnation of God or prophet or anything. The trouble about a great people becoming known is that they become at once cataloged. We give them a name and put them in a category and we place them there and we do not then have the tendency of examining him. If you call Christ the Savior, you have already cataloged him. Oh, who is Christ? Oh, he is the Savior. They are, everything is finished. You do not want to examine Christ in every detail. Here I would like to, I, what I am trying to say about Sri Ramakrishna is that I do not want to put him in any category. And then I'm studying as a person about whom a great deal is known, authentic. And we find the most extraordinary person, most extraordinarily endowed with exquisite qualities, spiritually exquisite qualities of head and heart. Those things all come into it. And then he went through spiritual struggles and spiritual practices. Very intense though they are, though they, they didn't occupy too long a time before he began to have visions of God. And so then, you see, if another person, although present there, didn't have this qualification and this ability, he would not have seen this vision. You see the difference there. They say that one of the characteristics of a spiritual experience is, rarely is it shared by another person, at the moment of experience. 
We are all here. If another person suddenly comes and begins to find this platform, all of us will see him as the simultaneous. That is characteristic of our sense now. But if you are to have a spiritual vision now, there is not any probability or they say very little probability of my or somebody else's actually seeing it in the same time. There have been very rare occasions when all have been able to see it. If you believe this story, you find in the New Testament the story of the Christ appearing before his disciples. You remember, Christ sent an advance message, they should gather in a certain place, and there he appeared before them. That is the gathering of the disciples. And it is on that occasion, you remember, the Apostle Thomas, he touched his hand by the marks of the nails so yeah, in order to be sure that it was not a hallucination on his part. Henceforth, we can know the doubting Thomas. And uh, Christ was there. But I have not the least doubt about it that if other people, not his apostles are present, that probably they would not have seen the Christ. This is one of the very few things, very few occasions we find mentioned where a spiritual vision has been shared. This is one of the very few things, very few occasions we find mentioned where a spiritual vision has been shared simultaneously by more than one person. <laughs> but generally speaking, you don't see it. One person sees another person, but he doesn't see it. I knew a friend of mine who used to have repeated visions of life. There was no knowing when he would have these visions. Maybe he was talking with someone, maybe he was watching. Maybe it is day or it is night, or it is daylight or it is dark, it will not make the slightest difference. Certainly there will be a searching of light. You, you just have a slight intimation of that immediately before his mind will become quiet, noticeably quiet, and as a result of this vision, his mind will become particularly serene. Others are well present that they did not see anything. And it was so bright a light, but then of course the brightness of a different quality, uh, that even the brightest sunlight faded in nothingness. Brightest sunlight also didn't mean anything to it. Generally, when in one light you see another light, if the second light is not bright enough, it appears very dim. As the moon appears very dim in the daytime. But not in that vision, that I will equally bright. Now, that is one of the characteristics of spiritual vision. The question here is, see, that with what says Sri Ramakrishna, anyone who has this vision, so is. There is a story about St. Peter, that when persecution became very really rife in Rome, he thought there was not any chance, and he left Rome. He left at dawn, and, or at night, and early hours to the morning, and as he came out of the city and passing through a forest, he saw a bright light at a distance from him, in front. And he thought it was the sun rising, but as he came approach to the light, and the approaching he also approached the sun, it was the shining form of Christ. And of course he fell at his feet and he said, Lord, where are you going? And it is said, the Christ said, I am sorry I cannot quote the exact light, my memory is not good enough. A beautiful word to God. He says, this was in substance. He says that he, my servant whom I entrusted with my people, he has left his post, so I am going to take his place. Something like this. So St. Peter was just deeply wounded in his heart. And with that Christ disappeared. And Peter returned to Rome, and as you well know, he became a martyr. Here was this. With what did St. Peter see the Christ? He saw the forest, he saw the skies, and there was the sun and fall. These things are not too rare, you know. Now, some people have said that, like everything else, just as you find here, you might say, luminous things you see. There are luminous objects, and some have said that those visions are made up of the luminous substance so that we are able to see, just as we can see the luminous things here. I do not think there is, there is that kind of explanation. Those of you who have read 
Jain says varieties of religious experience, remember, that he noted particularly that mystics they begin to have a sense of right always. I think he gave his opinion called sophism or something like that. That they have a, a sense of light, visions of light, light around themselves, right in their mind. And that's true. It is really light. Knowledge is in compared to enlightenment and light, it is not just merely. You must not think that it is a kind of symbolic link. There is whatever that light is and with whatever you may perceive it. And that is the point I immediately, immediately like to discuss. It is true that there is a sense, a growing sense of light and more light and more light. Eventually we realize that the light is a living light. Light demand. Well, anyhow, the question is what do they see this for? If you come to, uh, if you want to uh, discuss more definite things, it's a huge claim that uh, God has many forms. That claim is that God has so many forms uh, that uh, we might say that his forms are endless. You cannot set any limit to the forms in which God may manifest himself. Although truly speaking, uh, so far as it is known, there are not too many. If you read the, all the holy books of the Hindus, you will find descriptions of God, of the divine, in many forms, male and female forms. May not be less, they are not endless, so far as the descriptions are concerned. But the attitude that is taken in this regard is that so far only very little of God in this regard has been known. And as time would pass, and let us say that we have still millions and millions of years of history before us, there is no doubt that many, many other forms of God will become revealed to us. Many, many other forms of God. And the Hindus became so enamored of this revelation that we might say that after Buddhism, when Buddhism began to decline, Hinduism took to the enjoyment of divine vision. You know, many of you all just say, oh, that is called, that is all politism. The Hindus are all politistic. They worship all kinds of gods and gods, idols and images and all kinds of things they put up and you think it's a kind of degradation of religion. Even knowing that it is a further discovery. It is all right that you first think that there is one God. You see, from a distance it looks one first. One blue mass of vegetation, you call it forest. That's very good. And you, 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 you all know, it's, oh, there is a forest there, six miles, hundred miles off. That's all you can say when you see the young forest. But you will talk a different language when you approach the forest and enter into it and have seen all the different kinds of trees that there are and how large they are what the different characteristics are, then you begin to talk in terms of many trees. There is one tree in such and such a place. There is this variety, there is that other variety, so there is an endless varieties of trees you begin to describe. Well, a fool who does not know would say, well, he's a degraded fellow. Instead of speaking of one forest, he speaks of many trees. And in the same way, I think many people, they begin to think that when people talk of many gods and goddesses, it is a degradation. And politicism is an improvement upon that. But we have never thought that. When you come with infinite touch with God, come very close to God, then you begin to see his infinite manifestation. And there is no reason why you should not be able to appreciate them, describe them. But you never lose the sense that it is the same God having many different forms. Vipra Bhuda Vadanti, Ekam Sat. They speak of this, the being is one. But the sages, no one of God, speak of this one in various ways. Because they find many manifestations of this. So afterwards, after the age of Buddhism, Buddhism itself we describe as a democratization, popularization of the fundamental principles of Vedanta and Upanishads. Those are the things which Buddha took up and popularized. He used different terms, comprehensible to the common people. He didn't want to use the learned language of Sanskrit and other systems of philosophical thought. He reduced everything to the essential thing as, as, as possible. 
just as today you find that we are seized with zeal to popularize knowledge, any kind of knowledge, even the very highest knowledge you want to make, want to make accessible to the common person. As a result, of course, there are other simplification doubts take place. As a result, you cannot use this long term which the scholar feels. But nobody blames you for that, they feel that there is a real benefit in such popularization. Both the period of that, there was a period, but then that period began to decline. And it is at that time that we found in India that uh, there is a move towards the enjoyment of many different manifestations of God. And that was the period of the Puranas in the Tantras. And you might almost say that the same period is still continuing in India. Well, you can well understand a man seeing a beautiful woman who becomes a place for all his life. In Ramatha, however, ho ho the whole world. Similarly, a woman would, if she falls in love, becomes accepted by a man. She would give everything to marry. If it is so, just consider how much accepted must be a vision of a God. Just consider it. We are nothing. Nothing that is to the human beauty, even the greatest human beauty, is nothing compared with the beauty of this divine vision. And when people have these divine visions, you see, they become so enamored of them, so changed, the love and the beauty and the sweetness of it all is so overpowering, then if you just tell them, now oh, you must also transcend this. Don't just remain in the tree, just learn also think of the one forest again. From a distance of the one forest, then you go and visit all the forest, then also again you must have a unitary idea about the forest. No, you just love, love the trees so much, you look at the trees and you just sit at the foot of the trees and you just fall asleep. This is what the souls do. I sometimes think that whichever religion has given its followers a taste of those things, uh, that religion has very little chance of returning back to its pure philosophical form, strong and philosophical form. Very little time. Well, that's my speculation. I won't go up on it too much. I'm quite wrong. Uh, let us hope I am wrong. Because there is no use in becoming stuck in one field of religion. Well, that is what happened in India. And you find, as I say in the books, you find records of all kinds of experiences and visions of God. I must not give you the idea that all these visions are beautiful in human terms, as body beautiful. No. Beauty can also be seen in the terrible, in the unaccustomed form. But beautiful, all of them are. The, the soul that saw these visions, to that soul, all these visions are good. They are terrifying, but you know, there can be also terrific beauty, a beautiful terror there can be, and the souls have all kinds of experience. If you ask why there should be this such a terror in the beautiful, it is because we have fear in our heart and then fear has to be overcome. In order to embrace reality, we cannot embrace reality as a whole, divine reality as a whole, if we have all these reservations in our mind, such as disgust, or preferences, likes, dislikes, fear, and so on and so forth, we may not do We shall have to approach God with the open mind, so that in whatever for me comes is the Lord, you are welcome into my heart. I am not afraid of you, nor do I dislike this from you. Then we have a closer vision of God. When we thought we have this, you know, I may be wrong. This is the result of my personal thinking. Not all of it, but parts of it. Maybe if I had read more books or uh, have come at, uh, in contact with more living sages, probably I could have uh, learned from them better things about it. That's probably the same things to, to which I have uh, arrived at. You see, it is quite admitted that when we see from outside, we see them by means of our senses. 
If I hear your voice, you will know that it is dependent on my sense of hearing. If I did not have this ear, I couldn't really hear your voice. Now, all these senses, now, as we are the form is concerned, of course, they are dependent on the eyes. We know it. Now, all these senses, if you think of these senses, would you say that they are parts of your body, or would you say they are parts of your mind? Or would you just say they are the parts of your vital energy, or prana, or life force? What would you say? To which category would these senses belong? Truth to tell, they belong to every, all of these things. Senses have got a physical counterpart, and you must admit then that in order that I could hear you, I, have, I must have adequate physical organ of hearing. My ears should be right. And not only that, that the nerves should be right, and that the nerve center, now it is recognized within the brain in certain part of the brain, there are different centers for the different senses. And it is said that when one sensation of, of a particular sense is carried to the center, it somehow sets up a reverberation there, and if it revives all past impressions, impressions of all past similar sensations. And they say that physically, in the brain, they find that that is what actually happens. The point here is that after this is all over, after all these things have been carried to the brain center, then where do they go? Not out in the brain itself probably, some kind of uh, unification or comprehension takes place. All these centers are uh, coalesced together to have a sense of unity. For example, I see you, I hear you at the same time. Maybe if you have got fragrance on your person, then I shall also smell. And all the several things will be simultaneously functioning regarding you. Well, all of those things get unified. There has to be somewhere in unification. Nevertheless, before they become part of our own knowledge, that is, they become comprehended in the mind, there has to be a transition from the body to something subtler, let us call it mind. When you say that I am seeing a red rose, it certainly does not remain limited to your brain sensation. If it is so, then you would not know it, you would not know this red rose. The red color of this particular rose form that is carried over, it is perceived in your mind, in your conscious mind. I am going through, through all this uh, uh, long process through which the perception takes place. But I must say here that if the senses belong entirely to the body, then the result of sense perception would not appear in the mind. I could not say that I am seeing a red rose, color sense, form sense, none of those things. Oh, it is a very fragrant rose, sense of fragrance and so on. And so. Oh, what a sweet voice this singer has. None of those things would be there if in the mind there are not called a counterpart of the senses. Our tendency generally is to say perception takes place. It is very convenient time to say perception takes place. But perception has got details in it. And we are now concerned with the sense details, forms, color, and, and so on and so forth. Well, how is it that these things appear in the mind? So my conviction is the senses should not be exhausted in our understanding with the brain, with the body alone. We should trace the senses in their final form to the mind. And maybe we should trace the senses even to the higher and higher part of the mind. We have noticed this. In order to be able to perceive anything, you have to have a corresponding state of mind. You would not recognize a soul passing by you if you did not have spiritual inclination. Long, long after, if somebody says, Oh, you didn't you see him? Now by this time he had become a spiritual aspirant, and he had heard of a great saint, and a friend of yours says, Why? You saw him? No, I don't remember that I have seen him. Oh, yes, you saw him. You remember on such and such a day we are passing along such and such a street? And a man was going by us, you looked at him. Yes, I remember. Is that the same? Yes, that's the same. Well, 
At that time his mind was not spiritually inclined, he didn't recognize him. Many people, no doubt surprised, but how many recognized him as the Savior? You have to have a state of mind. If you do not have this state of mind, that even if the thing is present before you, don't perceive it. Anyhow, you do not apprehend it. So you see, if I am to see the vision of God, say, suppose I want to see the Buddha form, I like to perceive God in the form of Buddha, in meditative form of Buddha. I have to have any single state of mind. It is quite clear that that state of mind does not belong to our accustomed mind. Our ordinary mind thinks very dull, tough, if emotions and all those things are impure, this mind is very, very gross. Then this thought, this state of mind could not belong to this lower mind. It has to belong to the higher state of mind. If they are then I see this luminous form of Buddha, then the senses, finest form of the senses, by which I shall see the form of Buddha, maybe I shall hear his voice too. This, this would be, these senses must belong to this higher mind too. They are also, they must be there. In short, I want to maintain this, that all the things that are supposed to be the evolution or ramifications of our consciousness, I am using the word consciousness in a very good sense. Consciousness is used, all, used also as a synonym for Brahman or Atman, which is different in beyond the mind. I am not using it that sense, I am using the descent in the mind and the self, all these things coalesce together to become the instrument or the subject of perception. Well, that consciousness is the highest consciousness, not the very highest, not the absolute, but just, just a little short of the absolute. That state of consciousness contains within itself the very senses in their purest form and the finest form. I would say, I would go so far as to say that all these emotions and things that we have within ourselves and we have them, our souls, or I should say we are hungry for human love. There are times when our heart cries for the mother, I say if my mother were here, or for a brother or a sister, or a friend, or sometimes a, a lord, and all those things, but sometimes our soul is hungry for a child. There are these in, in, in extinguishable hunger in our soul there. It seems to me that as long as mankind has been there, one or another and all of them have been raging in the hearts of men. And they have never been quenched, never been satisfied. And they say, some of our sages say, that yes, they have their very finest form. And in that form when you realize them, they also, you also will realize your objects of this form. There is an eternal mother. You see how Mary in this New Testament, she is just an ordinary woman. So much so that Christ refused to see her one day. When she came with her other children to marry him, he told her to see her. If you have to believe the New Testament stories, the Madonna has not much place there. And yet she, the, the Catholic mind, and my Catholic mind, I myself am a great devotee of the Madonna. It's one of the most beautiful religious conceptions of the world. It is not just merely wish fulfillment. There have been devotees who had the vision of the mother, of the mother of God, of the Madonna. There have been such people. Now we thought did they see her? They saw her, and they thereby found a satisfaction of this longing in their hearts for the mother. There are these hungers of our soul. You might say this belongs to the lower place, in this lower region. They do not belong to the higher region, you generally outstrip them. You forget all these human failures, all these thoughts and hungers. You know all those things are transitory things. What is father and what is mother regarding soul and God? If there is father, father in heaven. Well, you call him father, but when you are pushed, you say, well, these names are just to be applied. But really you cannot say anything about him. That's the highest flight of philosophy. Yet 
think they say that all these things, all the basic things in human nature, that they exist in the finest form, is almost the very highest state of consciousness. Well, it would be too much if I go into any more details about it. It will make me discuss cosmology, that is how for Hindu one the many begins to manifest itself. And then I need to trace the possibility of the senses in this, or emotions in this, uh, in the very beginning of this evolution, cosmic evolution. Well, if I have to do that, it will take too long a time. But I shall say, my, my feeling is all these things dwell there. Unfortunately, my friends, as I many times point out to you, even in senses, even in the sense plane, we do not know how to behave here. I would say, if it did not sound rather terrible to religious people, you do not know even how to use your senses here. If you could use your senses rightly, there would not be anything to be condemned there. Nothing to be condemned there. If you could see with these eyes, true eyes, true vision, if you could hear with the true ears, true hearing, if everything would be all right, everything here is wrong, vitiated. Everything has become gross here, everything is rotten here. People don't like my saying those things. First of all, we are Americans, we don't like to listen to that kind of thing. <laughs> uh, once I spoke in that way, and a, a strange lady who has come to the lecture in the middle of the lecture, after the lecture, she approached me, she jumped. And she said, you go back to India and tell them this kind of thing. We are everything <laughs> after that. And she began to say, lots of things against India. Well, that's my here here and there. So, many people have that attitude. They think that Americans are made to say, wonderful, 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 wonderful. And they say, great, big breath and big, big chest and say, how wonderful. What a glorious morning. If that was all the significance of being an American, then we must lose all hope. America has got a great deal more potency, great deal more potency than all these superficial What do you have here? Everything is vulnerable here. Before you have built up anything, it disintegrates. Nothing can be accomplished here. When you build a wonderful palace on a ground which itself you find is slippery, Everybody will call you that you are just an utterly foolish person where they such a huge and beautiful building on ground which are uncertain. Then you may as do that. On what are you going to build up the vision of your life? And all these achievements, what would be the foundation of all this? My friends, unfortunately it is that we are living in a level where everything is very, very gross and very, very vitiated. Senses are also vitiated here. If the senses are not vitiated, senses are pure. Eyes are pure eyes. Every sense is pure. Every emotion is pure. Then the object of these senses and emotions also would be very, very pure. Even God Himself, who is the only pure being. So, there, I do not see any difficulty in thinking that we can see visions of God. You might say, yes, maybe senses are in that higher mind. We shall accept that. In a very high state of consciousness, you also have the senses they are inherent in the finest form possible. We shall accept that. But how do you know that there are things to be perceived by these senses at that level such as God? Well, this is one argument I should give. There are other arguments can be given. In every plane of perception, we perceive being. But according to the level of our perception, then being becomes overclouded either by our sense of matter, our sense of mind, and so on and so forth. In this plane, where everything is perceived by, through the medium of the flesh, is it there, through the medium of matter, the substance, the being, appears to be a material being, essentially. The substance, the being, appears to be a material being, essentially. 
But isn't it safely where we have traced our river? And where we find that emotion senses all us, at least to their in their highest and purest form. It would follow that if we perceive anything, it contains in itself the purest of beings, it is not. It could not be material being, it could not be anything else or mental being, it could be pure being, that is, it is spiritual being. So when this spiritual being and all spirit is God, has to be God. And therefore, if our senses function and perceive form there, this will be form Shukra. I have not yet answered one objection which I raised, raised on your behalf, that isn't it true that if God is formed, thereby God becomes limited? Yes, in a sense, but not in another sense. Those who see God with form, they perceive God is infinite and eternal. All these basic things are perceived of him. But we see that his perception of God in the realm of manifestation. So that there is one aspect. God is considered an infinite aspect. But they are we perceiving only in one aspect. If a devout Christian has been worshipping the Lord as Christ, Somehow he has fallen in love with the Christ child, and he has been craving to have vision of the Christ child. Recognizing that the Christ in whatever form is God himself, eventually he will see the Christ child. He will recognize his divine, and all those things which are spoken of, of the divine are there. Uh, that he is infinitely determined in the all, his process and everything. But in so far as the manifestation aspect is concerned, he will perceive only the child aspect of God, the Bambino aspect, Christ child aspect. There are many other manifestations of God. It is in this regard that there will come a sense of limitation only. But you know that limitation is not limitation to be developed. If somebody goes, don't you want to see the Christ as preaching the Sermon on the Mount? Or he is thrashing the money changers out of the temple, don't you want to see him in that respect? Or Christ is all powerful, the king and so on. No. No, 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 no. I don't want to see him like that. I want to see him as a child. So to the devotee it is not a limitation. It is a choice. It is as if you like one kind of music and you don't like another kind of music. If you don't have the other kind of music, you do not say, well, I didn't get what I wanted. You rather are happy that other kind of music was not playing for you. And the kind that was, I didn't get what I wanted. You rather are happy that other kind of music was not playing for you. And the kind that was playing was the kind which you like. So you may say that in that respect there is a limitation, but not in the other respect, not in the basic attributes a basic being of God. This all you perceive. So you see, to come back to my subject then, if there is a possibility, if what I have told you has some basis in fact, I have not told you anything new, mm -hmm. but similar things have been said, but probably I have tried to pinpoint these things a little more clearly. That's all there is to it. Well, if these things are true, what I would say, then I think there opens before us an infinite realm of divine vision. It's a visible form. Visible here, you might say, even to these senses, in the sense that you can see it against this ordinary background of this world, you can see this form. But so far as the form space is concerned, the divine form space is concerned, it is being perceived by the finest form of the senses. The finest aspect of the senses and not the ordinary aspect of the senses. Always you must remember the object of perception calls for a quality of perception and therefore a certain quality in the instrument of perception. Ability means instrument, all these things have to be uh, 
corresponding to the object of success. If I want to see a very distant star clearly, I can have to have a telescope. I can not say, you know, with this very bright idea. If I want to see very close, then I can see the eyes are quite adequate. So then, our sense, if you want to perceive visions of God, visible forms of God, even they be part of this normal world, even then there has to be this heightened consciousness, functions of the heightened state of the things. When there are three kinds of visions, God sees when everything else becomes obliterated. Mm -hmm. You may see outside that it's going to suddenly come to you with vision, and you would not perceive anything else at that time. You just see this form of God. And another kind of visions of this form of God may come in many people. They have maintained that there is a difference in effect between these different kinds of the visions of God. When visions of God come are asked for, and it has come without any proper preparation for yourself, a sustained preparation, the effect of this vision does not last too long. Whereas if you have struggled, you have trained your mind and purified your mind, Hiding your consciousness, and as a result of it, you find in the depths of your meditation, you have seen the vision of God. Then that is considered of utmost importance and very effective, and the result is considered to be permanent. As a matter of fact, when you consider that even if you have other visions of God, you must have the same vision or similar vision of God. Through meditation, through spiritual discipline, otherwise you have not achieved the spiritual result permanent. These are visible. Well, I shall try to speak of another aspect of the visible God. But before I do that, let me at least for variety speak of the invisible God. The invisible God can be considered from two points of view personal as well as impersonal. And when I say personal, I should warn you, as I always do, I do not necessarily mean that he has found. Many people I have found uh, that they think by person, a person is a form or a body. And I do not see how a person has necessarily to have a form. If suddenly all life were to disappear, and I want to talk to you, you or even if we are seated here, we could still regard ourselves as persons, although you could not see our phone. Could you not? I do not see what body has got to do with it, or a form has to do with a person. The essence of a person is that he is self-conscious. But when I speak to him, he understands me and he can respond to me. That seems to be the essence of being a person. And God is can be considered a person in that respect. He is self-conscious and he is conscious of me. He is conscious of his creation, conscious of other beings and he can respond. Another element in our understanding of the personal God is that he is endowed with infinite attributes and qualities. Some say that all these things are just beneficial qualities, and I think in the last analysis you have to say that, but if you say that beneficial qualities are necessarily comfortable and pleasant to us, I don't think that's true. Sometimes some of the qualities of God, how beneficial they are, they have the most unpleasant impact upon our lives. You know, it is a truism. I should not say truism, it is a truth, a great truth. Very well known and very well respected. Whatever happens to a devotee of God is for his good. It is not an order given by somebody. Or it is an injunction laid upon us by a prophet. In the name of God or in his own name, nothing will become. 
We realize it as such. We find. Maybe at the time we may not always understand it as such. Afterwards we look back up, back upon this unhappy experience. We find that we derive a great deal of benefit from it and on the whole it has made us happier and better. Pain cannot be denied. Suffering is there, it cannot be denied. It is like taking a very strong medicine, a bitter medicine. Yes, at pleasant, when while we swallow it, it is bitter, uh, but we are healed of our sin. Therefore, oftentimes the gifts of God, that themselves wonderful beneficial, they come to us, but then we do not feel them as very pleasant or comfortable. We sometimes suffer, we find them very painful. But the result is very good. And uh, uh, because of that, it has been said God is endowed with beneficent quality. Kainano, Ashesh, Kainano, Gunate. Endless beneficent quality. Others can say that why means matter. What you call evil here, that also comes from God. And what you call good here, that also comes from God. No good and evil come from Him. And I make this distinction, recognize that all, both are equally the manifestations of God, happiness and sorrow are equally the gifts of God and accept them as such. Then if you take that view, whether they are pleasant or unpleasant, and they are good or they are evil, you say that all belong to God, and then you ascribe many, you can make terrific qualities to God. We are forced to do it anyhow. He is the giver of death, can you deny it? When a mother loses her child, you, you could not by any stretch of imagination say, oh, what a wonderful thing has happened to you. You couldn't say, either in regard to the mother or to the child. The child couldn't live to accomplish anything, and what an agony it is, the death is to the mother. It couldn't say anything. But that is, you have to say that if there is one cause, the cause of all causes, an ultimate source from which all things proceed, you have to say that this also proceeded from God. What can you do otherwise? Here, a new approach, a new attitude of mind is called for. The attitude is this. I say, Lord, I do not have any preference. I have no likes or dislikes. I do not say I like this and I dislike the other thing. I have given up my preference. All strong souls do that. When you are asked, you are a captain, your general has called you, captain, you have to take so many people and go and then there. But I warn you. It is a position of great danger. What does the captain say? Does he say, he takes so, then I won't go there. He doesn't say that. He says, he will just yes, say, yes, sir. He will go. Souls become like this. All of our souls have become strong. Souls have lost, have given up all preferences. If you know, I like this, I don't like this, I shall do this, I don't know. All things are given up. If you say if all things are given up, if goodness also given up, goodness in a relative sense is given up. In a superficial sense is given up. But when you have, when you have no longer have any preferences, then you rise above both good and evil. And there is a transcendental goodness which cannot be understood in the terms of good as we are mixed in the relative life. And it is that which becomes manifesting, manifesting us. Noble things begin to shine to us. Kindness, compassion proceeds from this kind of thing. When a man doesn't have any preference, he becomes established in perfect self-abnegation. When he becomes the tenderest of person, the most compassionate, the most sympathetic. It is not true of service, it is not absolutely selfless. A good thought for thought, extinction, annihilation, new one, as the ultimate destiny of man, 
the very first thing that I think of, that this is the visible God. This, this is the visible That is the form of God. This is the form of God. This God is a visible before our senses even in this. I say, if God is the only reality, and He has to be the only reality, because there can be no, only one infinite being, and God is infinite by definition, then what about this must be God? If you say this exists, this material universe exists, then whether you see it, evidently or not, we cannot escape the conclusion that even this very so-called material universe is God himself. Swami Vivekananda therefore says, here is God himself extended before you, many days before you, and you ignore you know, him and then you search for him elsewhere. This is the visible God. More than any other thing, I like this idea of the visible God. You see, it has got an immediate effect upon your life. Every part becomes holy for you. Everything is holy. Every being is holy. There is nothing which is unholy here. There is nothing which is less than the highest in the grace. And you say, yes, I appreciate the sky in the mountain to the field. Many people say, well, I see God in forests in the mountains and the rivers, but I find it very hard to see God in heaven. And in other words, in human image nature, we seem to have our better mind function. But when it comes to man, we don't like most of them, we don't like them. You see, if you have to have this vision, you will be forced to like everything, you will be forced to see the deepest in every person. If you know me, I know their feet, I know their feet here, I know their bad people here, and how can I see him as God? Of course he is in my God. If you get a rough diamond, a big diamond, and then some people are using yes, it is diamond. And you say, well, I don't see any diamond, it does not shine, it doesn't glitter. Would you think in this terms and throw it away? No. You have said it's not anywhere. Well, I'm glad to know that it is diamond. So I have to make it shine. So you take it to a jeweler and he will grind it for you until he has found the surface to be the hidden light and shine for exquisite. Then you say, ah, that's it. You have to take the level of grinding. It does not mean. You see, whichever idea of God you might have, worship you must. In other words, you must make adequate efforts. To realize God, whether you consider God as the prophet or the savior, whether you think to me that God has got this form or that form, whether God exists within you or outside of you, it doesn't matter, but you have to make an effort to be able to pursue Him, each in where He is. And in this particular case, you look at this whole universe and you say, this is God. Therefore, Every particle in it is divine, and therefore, since we are most concerned with human beings, human, ourselves, we ourselves being human, therefore, in every person we say, hidden behind this appearance, physical appearance, hidden behind imperfect behavior and conduct, hidden behind this green phase of imperfect mind, there is this perfect God. All this is an imperfect facade. A most beautiful person could put on a mask which is ugly. That would not make that person less beautiful. Say, most exquisite being is hidden under this multiple form. Infinite are his arms, infinite feet, infinite are his eyes. And he spreads. He pervades the whole universe in an exceed. You see the being said before I this is a real visible God. I'd like to speak to you. 
And I like to recommend that you learn to think in that way. Because you see then, every moment of your existence would be a contact with divinity. Once you get accustomed to this thought, you will find that you are living in an extraordinary world. If you believe in the kingdom of heaven, and you know there is a semitic belief that one sometime in future the kingdom of heaven will be established on earth, you just go a little farther and remind yourself the kingdom of heaven is already here. That is God himself. God is everything, there is nothing but God. And here, in what one state I am, there is God. If I open my eyes, I see God in this infinite form before me. If I close my eyes, I can see God within my own heart. And so you see, our view is, these are all these Vedantic things. But, like every other philosophy or every other religion, it has its own preference. The preference for Vedanta is that if you want to have a visible God to worship, have this visible God. Worship it as it is. This is a chaksam before your very eyes. Worship it. Serve it. Let me see it happen. Worship man as God. Because man is not really man, it is God himself. God himself is come before in the form of man. The rock diamond. You will be grand. And make it shine. Rock diamond is also diamond. It is not a pebble or a stone. Just because it is not shining for you now, it is not less diamond, therefore. So, this line you can make it shine. That is your effort. Think and perceive in such a way that everything is recognized by your mind and consciousness. Mm -hmm. This kind of visible God is a preference of Vedanta.